This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief, Sierra 117, and you're listening to Podcast Unlocked, the world's number one Xbox podcast. Now, finish this fight. Master Chief, out. What's happening, friends? Welcome to Podcast Unlocked, episode 443 for May 12th. 2020. Ryan McCaffrey here. I'm joined, of course, by Destin Legary. Bam! Hey, everybody. There it is. Pe- making that, just peeking that audio. Love it. <laughs> Miranda Sanchez. Hello. Hello. And Brandon Tyrell, my friend. Hello. All uh, right. Uh, how you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm just uh, I'm kicking back. I'm, you know, just no no shoes, right? In a home office. Who needs who needs to be wearing <laughs> shoes? Feet are up on the couch here. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's fine. It's I I've actually lost track. I think this is week nine. I think <coughs> it's I Tuesday, think right? I'm not yes. actually sure. We're recording, so it's Tuesday. That's how I know. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it would be Bagel Wednesday, but we don't get bagels now. That's true. Um, I have it in my journal, so I have a, I keep a planner, and then I write work from home every single week in the top corner, and I have it like planned out and estimated to how far we'll be work from home. So I don't lose track of how many times we've been uh, still here. Well, the good news is the world of Xbox keeps spinning and things have been good. We've got a lot to talk about this week. So oh, yeah. uh, I want to start with a couple of plugs because, hey, it's the top of the show. This is when you're paying attention. So check this stuff out if you would be so kind. So I've got a new episode of IGN Unfiltered Up. Didn't end up doing one in April because of everything that that went down, of course. Uh, but I was able to record one remotely. Not my preference. Would have been great to have you know face-to-face in the studio, but it is what it is. And it's particularly relevant to the Unlocked audience because my guest this month is Marcus Leto, longtime Bungie veteran. And he is now uh, on his new game at his new studio. The game is Disintegration, which Brandon has talked about a lot on this podcast. But he told a bunch of great Halo and Bungie stories. So I would uh, wholeheartedly encourage any and all of you to either go watch it on IGN or on YouTube, or you can go listen to it on your favorite podcast service as well. Uh, now, also, Brandon, the Ascent. Hi. Hi. Yes. Uh, Next generation video games. We have them. <laughs> we have one of them. Uh, is at least on certainly the seems that way. Yeah. Yes, the Ascent is, uh, of course, one of the games from the stream last week. Mm-hmm. That is our IGN first game for May, and we have twelve minutes of actual gameplay, real gameplay. Which, of course, we're going to talk more about that in a second. Uh, as far as the whole gameplay versus not gameplay thing. But yeah, we've got it. 12 minutes of it on IGN or IGN's YouTube. Check that out. And just a public service announcement real quick. Red Dead Redemption 2 now on Game Pass, which is just crazy to me. I mean, I know the I know it's it's I guess it's about a year and a half old at this point, which it feels like it's not. Feels like it just came out, but that is one of the biggest games on the planet that is just available with your Game Pass subscription. So, go play it if you have not already. Also, be sure to check out our huge Red Dead Redemption 2 guide. Uh, I, myself and the entirety of our wiki team worked on that guide like endlessly. It was like such a huge undertaking for us. Uh, I wrote all the hunting guides and a lot of the collectibles and stuff. So please go dig all that up if you need any help. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you guys, uh, there is a lot to cover. If you're, if, if there were ever a game for all of you to Voltron <laughs> onto, it, it's that game. Yeah, that was it. And then uh, the second one we've done so far is Animal Crossing, which is the, us all doing it is very, very rare. And the next one for sure is going to be Cyberpunk. So looking forward to that. Yes. Yeah. A lot of good stuff to look forward to. Uh, so last week's Xbox event. Uh, let's see. So it's Destin. We didn't get to hear from you because you were busy producing the darn thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Last week, but uh, last week, Sydney hosting. So for people wondering, that was sort of a I don't even want to get it. It's just there were business and other reasons why uh, Sydney hosted, which I was happy to have her. Uh, and it's just, I was happy to just be a, a panelist and just talk when called upon. But uh, as you can see, I'm back, back in the host chair and uh, I appreciate Sydney stepping in and, and uh, running that whole thing. Cause she, it, for those of you that don't, I mean, you don't know it's, she had a, a producer in her ear. She had us to worry about trying to not talk over each other. She had ad breaks to try and manage Hosting that thing was no easy task, so uh, thank you to Sydney for for uh, stepping in on Unlock last week. But back to the usual crew now. And Destin, 
What did you make of things last week? We had uh, Aaron Greenberg came out. Uh, I'll let you, I'll, I'll sort of hand the ball off to you on this and kind of address the reaction to things. But mm-hmm. where did you stand with the Xbox event last week? So before we get to the apologies or mismanagement part, I just want to talk about my initial impressions from the event. And I tweeted after yeah. it and I was like, I, I really like that event. I think Tom Marks did a great article about our expectations for next gen and sort of where people are landing on what they're imagining next gen is going to be like. We're not going to see a 360 to Xbox One jump. We're, we're not going to see these these major shifts because PC gaming is is constantly right there and consoles have finally caught up where they're like neck and neck. Uh, the games that we did see, however, were gorgeous. I think the biggest misstep was it did seem like they promised gameplay and then we got a lot of trailers, but the trailers we did see had me really, really excited. Bright Memory Infinite actually has a demo on PC right now that you can, or Bright Memory is a game on PC that you can go play right now. Bright Memory Infinite will be will be the version that you end up playing on Xbox Series X and the Xbox family. Uh, Scorn, you guys kept going back to it, which was great. I can't wait to check oh, that out. It has that. No. That... <laughs> Brandon, it's Geiger, right? It's like that Giger. art style. Giger? Yeah. yeah. HR Giger is the artist. It's his really? art. I always thought it was pronounced HR Geiger. I've had it wrong this whole my whole life, huh? Go, go Google. No, I think it, I, I believe it's Giger. And I, I think I remember that because I always pronounced it Geiger as well. And someone much smarter than me said Giger one day. And I was like, huh. And I Googled it and I believe it's Geeker, but Interesting. Um, anyway, his art is really prolific and and really emblematic of like the Aliens franchise. A lot of like weird sort of biotech stuff, which is where it might look familiar. Yeah. And then there's like, like here from my tweet, I, I called out specifically Beyond Extinction, Call of the Sea, Medium, Chorus, and The Ascent. The Ascent, which you can see gameplay of on IGN <laughs> right now. Those games had me really excited. And, and I was really happy to see a lot of people like that tweet because apparently I wasn't the only one that actually really enjoyed the conference. I think the overwhelming consensus is people are expecting, uh, I don't know, E3 or live gameplay or something like that. And um, maybe it's something structurally that's just more difficult to do that quickly for big companies. And we haven't quite seen that yet. Even the the Tony Hawk reveal, which we'll get into a little bit later in the show today, um, that had like pre-recorded gameplay and stuff like that. But I know IGN's going to do a bang-up job. If you did watch our pre- and post-show, I'm very, very proud of what we managed to do as as a content team. No one person can take credit for that. Um, It was really, really working together, and I'm really happy with what we were able to produce, and I can't wait to, you know, use what we all learned and put it towards our summer of gaming that is coming down the the line. Uh, My reaction to the Xbox event, it was positive. I really liked it. Yeah, I mean, it was it really was a heck of an undertaking, You're right? It's like seeing behind the scenes, like, cause, like I said, I was just an idiot on camera that that said words when they told me to say words. But the every you and everybody behind the scenes is just amazing. I mean, uh, I'm broadcasting now through a, a brand new, like nice, fancy camera that the company had shipped to me. I've got I've got fancy lights on either side now. So it's like we're we're taking this as seriously as we can as far as trying to deliver a, a studio quality production from home and and so far so good like it, it went off uh, really well on thursday and and the nice thing is we have a lot more of these uh, we're going to talk more later about about the ubisoft event we're going to have of course the july first party event for microsoft destin you mentioned all of our summer of gaming stuff but um yeah it was it was it was a good first step uh, last week even if the maybe the expectations didn't match with the reality in fact as I alluded to a minute ago, Aaron Greenberg, the marketing head, marketing boss at Xbox for many, many years now, and a good friend of the show, too. He tweeted out saying, uh, had we not said anything and just shown the May Inside Xbox show like we did last month, I suspect reactions might have been different. Clearly, we set some wrong expectations, and that's on us. We appreciate all the feedback and can assure you we will take it all in and learn as a team. So... Um, you know, that they've got this, this was a good learning opportunity for them because the next one, or at least we don't know what's going on for June yet. Uh, cause they've promised something every month, but the July one for the first party games, that's the one that they, that's got to yeah. go off 
perfectly because that's the one that's their chance for for them to finally answer the the just lingering hanging horrible question that's been over them for an entire generation of where are your first party games so good learning opportunity for microsoft there absolutely all right uh news wise this week where are my Tony Hawk fans at in this in this uh, podcast? I'm seeing, I'm seeing a couple hands up. That's good. So, Miranda, I'm going to go your way here. Please share the good news with the Unlocked audience. We are getting Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 remakes uh, later this year, which is super exciting because those are some OG games with excellent music that are just so fun. Um, I was one of the people who actually played on PC. I remember I had this like weird little contr- like third party controller is like the, plugged in. I was like, oh, it's my game time. Tony was Hawk. it the Gravis gamepad? Does it go that far back? I have no idea which one it was. A little white thing that kind of looked like a Super Nintendo controller with like red, yellow, blue, uh, green buttons on it. Okay, not that one. I'm derailing. Anyway, Go ahead. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, so we're going to get that. It's going to be a compilation remake of the first two games, which is really excited. Um, I think everyone has very fond memories of those two. I think I actually played more of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 um, and a lot of two, though. So it'll also be my first time like getting experience parts of one. Uh, so the game is a remake compiling the first two games, including all the levels and the secret ones, which is like one of the the coolest things like there's a lot of secrets in these games so as someone who loves game secrets it's very exciting to know that they're going to make sure that this is as authentic as they can to the originals um i think my biggest question right now is will they have all the music so hopefully the the trailer uh had a splash screen of a ton of artists in there but i don't know tony hawk well enough to know if it's if it's all the original uh (laughs) songs or not because of course licensing with music is is such a you know, you can't just remit, you can't just bring it back. You got to pay the artists again. So right. Who knows about that stuff? Yeah. So I think uh, that's my homework for later is to go back and like cross check every artist that they list in there to make sure it's good. But I'm pretty sure they they'll nail it. Um, so that's out on September 4th, 2020 for Xbox One, PS4 and PC, I think it was which is weird because yeah. it's all last gen stuff. It's like weird to say last gen, but you know, it'll be like just <laughs> before next gen stuff. So it's like, all right guys, let's, let's close it out strong. We got Tony Hawk back. We're going to have cyberpunk in September. So it'll be some fun times. Yeah. Destin, how are you feeling about this? You're a fan as well. Yeah. I like Tony Hawk and I'm glad they're not just porting the original one and two that they're making some updates to the engine. Um, they did say that if you pre-order it early, you can get access to, uh, the warehouse level, I believe they said. Mm-hmm. So demo, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that'll be that'll be nice to get in early and get your grind grinds in <laughs> ahead of time. <laughs> I had to be careful with my phrasing on that one, <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I really really like the Tony Hawk series. It was all about building insane combos and just seeing how long you could go on, on a rail and you know doing flips in the air and it, it was a lot of fun. I hope it holds up and I hope this new yeah. vision version. Uh, being worked on, is this by Vicarious Vision? It is, correct. By any yes, chance? Sir. Yep. Yeah, so they previously actually worked on Destiny's, one of Destiny's best expansions, Forsaken. So it's really, really cool to see them, um, you know, now that they're still, they're still with Activision developing another one of my favorite franchises, Tony Hawk. Yeah, they're one of Activision's longtime uh, support studios. They're wholly owned by Activision, so they've they've worked, they've touched a lot of, they've probably touched almost everything that Activision has put out in some way, shape, or form. Um, and yeah, it's Tony Hawk's. Th- these games are interesting. It's a couple things. One, it's it's arguably a rare instance where the video game has made the person more famous. Like Tony Hawk was already super famous in the 90s but the the games they were so the, so big at the time one and two particularly which is obviously what's getting remastered here like it turned him turned tony hawk into a household name for mm-hmm. an entire generation of kids which i'm not sure another video game can you even say that for another celebrity another public figure yeah i was i was actually just thinking about this as you were talking about it and i think the closest one would be madden maybe yeah. I mean, everyone who follows football knew John Madden, but, you know, video game fans who like really like playing football video games to him, he was he is now synonymous with football. So right? I actually didn't know for a long time that that was a person. I was just like, <laughs> oh, I don't like to call Madden, but like, I know that's football for me. Yeah. Like, that's what it was for a long time when I was a kid. And then eventually I learned it's like, oh, John Madden. 
Yeah. Oh, I Mr. see. Mr. Kerduckin. <laughs> Mr. Football. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, gosh, he, he retired from broadcasting well, like, what, a, yeah. yeah, like 20 years ago now. Like, yeah. So that's, that's true. That's probably the other best. That's another great example, but it's a short list and Mr. Hawk is on it. But uh, yeah, I think for me, I know <laughs> everybody, that, people that listen to this podcast for a while know that I kind of have a love hate relationship with, with remasters and remakes, but See, I, I'm I'm totally on board for this one uh, because I think it's it's this, these games are old enough now. Yeah. Where there's been enough time, it's like it's like a an inverse statute of limitations where it has to be long enough before I'm like super excited about it getting remastered. And in this case, it has been a long time. Such it, it, particularly when you you think about like these games are basically not playable now. Correct. Otherwise. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. So yeah, but Ryan, uh, what about the 360 downloadable Tony Hawk one? That are we going to talk about that? Are we going to get into <laughs> that? Right like, I, I mean, I don't remember. I remember uh, it was not good. Right? Xbox Live there was some new ones. Yeah, yeah. And yeah it was, it was basically a, a, it, it was like a remaster, version. right? Yeah, yeah. It was basically it was Tony Hawk Digital. I can't remember what it was called, but it was 2013. I want to say that recent. Yeah, it, it was pretty recent. recent. Wow. I was at IGN. I was on the th when we had the third floor. I was down there, and I remember playing it when we had cubicles still. So um, <laughs> that makes me feel old. <laughs> we, we did, and yeah. I say we, but it was before I joined the company, like a year before I joined the company. But IGN did a live stream of that game. Um, it just it didn't go well. So I'm really glad that you know the pedigree of the franchise, the pedigree of the series is is getting another crack because I think. You know, so many people in in my age group, anyway, Ryan. I think you can probably speak to this as well. Like Tony Hawk was it. Like it, it was that perfect cross between a smash video game and like the sort of cultural zeitgeist of the moment, where skateboarding was just blowing up everywhere. Yes. You had you know the Birdman doing nine thousands at the X Games, which is a sentence that just made me feel a hundred years old. Nine hundreds, um, Brandon. I believe you mean nine hundreds. Uh, nine hundred, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, it all it all was just this like perfect sort of pocket of culture at the time. So I'm I'm really like and that soundtrack. Um, there's a there was a still in the trailer that had like ten of the artists out of twenty something total ones. But anytime I hear like two bars of one of those songs, I immediately auto complete it in my head and just start singing along. So it's it's super iconic. I'm really glad this whole package is coming together because it does give us a chance to relive that nostalgia which we otherwise wouldn't have done unless you want to hook up, you know, your PlayStation or your Dreamcast. I, I just to close this out, I want to add, uh, I, I do have a super brief Tony Hawk story. It was my first or second E3 when I just started out. So this would have been like 2003 or 2004. And I took a behind closed doors demo at E3 of whatever that year's Tony Hawk was, which it could have been two for all. Maybe it was either two or three, probably. But uh, uh, and Tony was back. He was behind. He was in the booth behind behind closed doors giving demos. Tony Hawk himself. And he could not have been a nicer guy. So uh, he like he wasn't just slapping his name on it. Like he super cared about those games and yeah. presumably still does. So I have my my one random Tony Hawk story. All right. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Dustin. Just watching the HD trailer, uh, yeah, they did a pretty good job on the HD remake. I'm I'm glad they're updating the engine though, because that, that yeah, when you go back and play those old games, like oh yeah, this was a different time in gaming, you know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the refresh <laughs> is definitely warranted. And I'm, yeah, I'm but, sure I'm sure it'll feel exactly the same, right? But that was such an important part of that game is that feeling of like you hit big air and there was just a certain rush you got as you were soaring through the air and that that uh picnic table was like barreling toward you you know um i really hope that the new engine like really maintains that feel because it was so fluid and it's it's a common theme through games that really are, are, are replayable throughout time just the feeling of movement like insomniac and spider-man um and uh sunset overdrive just games that are really really make you feel like you're actually doing the thing that you're doing yeah and uh the the trailer I thought did a good job. There were a couple of shots in that trailer if you haven't watched it, where they do a a quick like cut from right, the yeah. original game, do it you know a guy doing it's the same exact shot, 
and then they cut from the old game to the new game and you get you get a really quick good look of like oh yeah this <laughs> this looks like a a relevant modern game now and it will be uh playable in 4k on the xbox one x so mm. that is uh good news for sure so september 4th that's coming up soon Next topic this week, and what I guess I would call our main topic, is once again, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Uh, we talked on the, the the live show last week, which of course was our Unlocked episode, about uh, feeling a little shortchanged on, uh, on the, <laughs> gameplay that they, the gameplay that they showed there. But uh, more information has continued to trickle out about Valhalla in the week since, and I, I really want to talk to you guys about this because... This, it's gotten uh, better, right? It, well, <laughs> the news. I maybe in some ways, <laughs> but in this way, I mean, this is this is being reacted to in a negative way, and I I want to see if you guys agree with it or not because I'm kind of of two minds on this, and it's this. So Assassin's Creed, this uh, the uh, the statement from Ubisoft after talk of this bubbled up. Assassin's Creed Valhalla will run at a minimum of 30 frames per second. Uh, and they're referring to the the next gen version on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. We are committed to offer the best experience to our players by immersing them in the most beautiful worlds and environments we could create, and leveraging not only the graphics enhancements offered by the next generation of consoles, but also faster loading times and new architectures. So a lot of people are disappointed at the 30 frames per second for Valhalla on Series X. There are a lot of people think, hey. I'm buying a, a, one of these brand new consoles for whatever it's going to be, 500 bucks, and it's only 30 frames. We've been, whereas the messaging really has been 4K 60 the, this whole time. So, where do you guys sit with this? Negative. I think it's a pretty big negative for yeah. the console, and I think it's a pretty big negative for uh, you know Ubisoft's flagship next gen title. Mm -hmm. uh, they're partnering with Xbox and they're coming out and they're saying 30 FPS and everybody, like you said, Ryan is sort of expecting this thing to be the leap to, to 60 frames per second. And it is a big letdown. You know, I I'm all in on Xbox. I love Xbox and everything. But and you own not... every Assassin's Creed game on Xbox. <laughs> they had a 75% off sale. And I was like, Please convince me not to buy the four Assassin's Creed games I don't own yet. Yeah, bi big fan, and Valhalla yeah. has me super stoked, right? But it's just another thing. I'm like, well, why would I play that on console if you're running at a minimum of 30? And I, I have the option of playing on PC. I'm glad they're committing to a minimum of 30. I think, mm -hmm. you know, playing... Well, gosh, on I should hope those. so. Yeah, well, so I was yeah, gonna say too. It's like at, at the minimum, okay. Yeah. If it was anything lower, it's like that's very concerning. <laughs> yeah, well, that includes 4K, right? So that makes me wonder if you're playing in 1080. I wonder if those frame rates are going to get higher. What's the variable going to be? Are they going to cap it at Good 60, point. like 1080, 60? I feel like there's some interesting information that hasn't been fully unveiled yet, um, because minimum of 30 means it can go higher. Mm -hmm. right so maybe if you're playing in 4k you're getting a 4k 30 experience maybe if you're playing in 1080 it will hit 60 and above because the console does up to 120 frames right miranda what do you what do you, what do you make of this mm, i'm i'm a little bummed i mean i think this is like this the first games of the bat right like i think we have higher expectations for things like halo and first party stuff third party i'm like okay guys you also have to show up for this and, and I think it's a little disappointing that you are noting that, hey, this is a possibility. But again, this is only a possibility, right? It's the minimum bar, not what they expect the standard to be. So I hope it's like, oh, well, maybe it'll dip to 30 if something's wrong. But I, I think it's it's something that we just need a little bit more information on or like to also actually see it more, you know, as a part of the criticism from last week. Uh, but uh, I think that's that's something that can change over time. And I, I know we're, we're, we're only getting started with Next Gen and we obviously want to come out swinging as hard as we can with those next gen graphics but um and frame rates specifically too because it's like one of the things we're most excited for um as far as like having sustained 60 frames like everything and so to have this be like one of the first big games that we know about but of course across all the platforms um and have it be like well it's still gonna maybe be at 30 is a bummer sorry my cats yeah <laughs> brandon where do you stand on this <laughs> 
I mean, I think I think Justin and Miranda covered it pretty well. Um, you know, it, the messaging is strange, right? There, I, I totally agree with Destin. I think there are missing components of this messaging that that didn't get relayed yet. Um, to say minimum of thirty means that there's infinite potential for a ceiling, um, even hitting one twenty. But then, why wouldn't you say that we're targeting sixty, or why wouldn't you say anything positive? You know, using the word <laughs> minimum and and thirty arguably like the standard for last gen or current gen, I guess now. Um, it, it It's just strange to me, the messaging of it. And and I don't really think that's an uh, Xbox Series X fault. Look, we know, the no. cons- we know the console's a monster. It sounds like an optimization thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's and a lot of... It's probably me- going to run better on... If anything, it'll be better on Series X than on PS5 based on the specs we have so far. Yeah, so there's a lot of meme in right now about how Xbox can, you know, only do 30. But, you know, it, the reason that they're talking about the Xbox right now is because it's partnered with Xbox, and you know, as a marketing partnership. So yeah. maybe it's maybe it's just you know has a has a floor of 30 FPS on both consoles, which would seem likely. Um, why, but why but it is they, why wouldn't they say 1080 can do 60, Brandon? Like why that's would a they? Great, that, that's a great question. That's a great question. I think because. Yeah. It's weird. They're targeting 4K, right? As like next generation is the generation of of you know 4K resolution. So maybe that has become the default resolution to speak to. Forgetting that you know there are as large of a contingent of people that are really into frame rate over resolution. For me, yeah, and their games. It depends on the game. Yeah, their games in the past also have that option, or at least I know many games have performance versus yep. fidelity mode, right? Which and makes it stranger, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know AC Odyssey, you had the option of doing one or the other. Um, and and so I, I just, I don't, I don't get the messaging. Um, I will say, however, that it's understandable that maybe it's not optimized yet because remember, this is a cross-generational game. It has been in development for four years. Um, and, you know, hardware specs, they know what they are well in advance, but there's only so much you can do with the time that you have. So, you know, I think there's a lot of room to 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 improve if it even needs to, because like we said, the minimum of 30 FPS seems like a starting point. So I don't think it's outside the realm of, of feasible to say that you would be able to run 4K60. I'm just confused by the messaging. You know? Yeah, so, so just asking everybody on the panel, if you could play at 2K60 or 4K30, which one would you choose? I would do 2K60. I want yeah, I want that really smooth feel. Miranda, like I have a, I have a 4K TV, and I I don't think I'd be missing much by playing it in standard 1080 at 60 frames. And because that's a game where there's so much movement and so much going on, I think that's probably the side of the barrier that I'd fall on. But it is a game by game basis, you know. Mm-hmm. If it were a locked, if it were like a buttery smooth 30, I would actually <laughs> probably choose the 4K 30 option, honestly, mm-hmm. for a game like Assassin's Creed. If it's Doom or Halo. Mm. I'd, I'd probably choose the frame rate. Give me but, all the frames. Yeah. Yeah. For, <laughs> for Assassin's Creed, frames. more of a more of a picturesque action adventure game, I think I would probably opt for the resolution. Now, what's what's funny to me is, Brandon, you touched on this about resolution uh, over over or frame rate over resolution. That's exactly what Phil Spencer said like a few months ago. So speak, kind of speaking again about the messaging and like mm-hmm. Phil. There was a, a, it went kind of viral around the gaming community where Phil said, uh, we, and we even had a thing on a poll on IGN where we said, do you agree with Phil Spencer that uh, frame rate trumps resolution? And it was like 85% of people agreed and said yes. So it's, you know, you've even right? got so Phil. It's, in, it's insane to me that now there's this cross messaging saying, yeah. and, and, and the meme culture picks up like X, Microsoft literally cannot win no, when it comes to it's, hardware. It's when that quote was out, yeah. it was like, oh, it'll do 60 frames, but enjoy your 1080p peasant. And then now it's, well, enjoy your 30 frames and your 4K resolution. I'm going to be playing. Yeah. It's, it's like, no, no one is, man. Player like, choice. Give us yeah. the choice. Period. Yeah. Problem solved. Well, this and, is a developer optimization thing. And yeah. I think I think it might have been Miranda that touched on this uh, a, a few minutes ago. Is what could have what could have uh, helped resolve this with it before it turned into a bigger thing was if they'd actually shown gameplay. Then we could have had a good barometer of 
oh wow, it's a stunningly gorgeous game. Maybe I'll be okay with a 30 frames per second trade-off, but because we only saw cutscenes, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard, hard to play. So uh yeah, we'll see what happens moving forward. But I mean this you have to figure like watchdogs, another big open world Ubisoft game, probably is gonna be in the same boat, right? Like probably gonna be uh not defaulting to 4k 60 because they share a lot of technology at ubisoft so it's the the, the ripple similar effect similar development similar yeah. development times as well like watchdogs is i mean i'm not going to say it's in the can but like it is getting close you know yeah. so a lot of this stuff was done before next gen was in mind yep yeah so we will see what happens in the uh, coming few months as we see more of valhalla <laughs> Speaking of which, we will see more of it in July. So July 12th, Ubisoft is doing their E3 press conference. They're calling it Ubisoft Forward, and uh, it will be a fully digital showcase with exclusive game news reveals and more. Now, they didn't list any games as part of the initial announcement, but uh, we've touched on a couple already. Uh, obviously, Valhalla will be a big part of that. There's also uh, the aforementioned Watch Dogs Legion. There's Gods and Monsters, which had been delayed a while back. There's Rainbow Six Quarantine, the next sort of standalone expansion-y type thing for Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, and I think those are those are kind of the big known ones. But yeah, it's uh, July, guys. This uh, not we're not not we're just skipping June since we don't have to. I guess <laughs> we don't have to do it. There are still some events in June. Um, speaking of events that are replacing for E3, you can find a full list of the ones that we have confirmed so far. If you search E3 2020 replacement events, we have a guide keeping track of all of that when they're when they're showing and when you can watch them. Um, but as far as like June events, IGN Summer of Gaming, thank you, Ryan. Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so in June we do have the Media Indie Exchanges Gorilla Collective, which is a mouth. That's just a lot to say. Um, but it's for an kind of indie game show. And then there's also EA play in June. That's true. So, summer, yeah. And the summer of cyber gaming starts thing in June, too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, I, I can share it. So I, I knew this was happening, but I just wanted to make sure that it was public. Uh, Ubisoft will be on summer of gaming before the July event. So if you're looking oh. for more Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, we'll have more details about our summer of gaming schedule as it comes together in June. But rest assured, you will be seeing more Assassin's Creed before we see even more Assassin's Creed. <laughs> yeah, I like um, the sound of that. Because of because of your guys' efforts at home, like Miranda, Ryan, and Brandon, and uh, you know what we're putting together on the tech side, I can I can confidently say, I think that we have the best looking and most professional conference lined up for you guys on IGN.com, and you're not going to want to miss it. Like, I'm seriously I'm, I'm so really excited. excited. About it. Yeah. So I've I've seen well, I've seen we our team You're is planning putting, it yeah <laughs> our, our team our team has put together a run of show for the first uh, I'm not going to say anything else our run of show is looking <laughs> very good right now um, I'm very excited for everyone to check out some of this stuff uh, lots of surprises in store that's great yeah I'm 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 not even fully looped in on on all of it so even uh, mm -hmm. I'm sitting I'm a little bit of a fan just kind of eager to see uh, what we're going to be doing but. Yeah, so you, you, July 12th for Ubisoft, uh, Microsoft doing a first-party showcase in July, but of course, Brandon, Microsoft will also be part of IGN's mm -hmm. Summer of Gaming. So yeah, it's going to be a, a very busy summer, which I'm kind of curious how everyone will feel about that when it's over in the sense of rather than it just being the Super Bowl in one week, just the Super Bowl week during E3 week, and then that's kind of it for the summer, really. I mean, yeah, there's Comic-Con, but that's not really games. And and then you, it's kind of nothing until Gamescom. Mm -hmm. But now this year, we're just going to be getting a, a, a lot of, uh, let's just call them, it's like a lot of playoff games, but maybe maybe it's fair to say no Super Bowl this year. Well, so. I mean, historically, some of those playoff games are way better than the Super Bowl anyway. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm really curious what this means for the future of E3 in general right like let's see let's take everyone's temperature at the end of june and or mid-july <clears throat> and see how we liked it what we thought of it and potentially what happens next year so they did already announce e3 2021 so that's right. on the books 
but we'll see how that goes. But E3, yeah, I mean, you're totally people are pulling out already. Yeah, yeah you're publishers to show up. You're totally right, but it's a partnership, right? Like the mm -hmm. ESA can can say, hey, we're having a party, but if nobody shows up, is it really a party? So <laughs> um, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, I mean, look, I. The odds are we all go back to normal next June anyway, right? Like, I hope so. Like, it seems like that's going to be the case. But in the years past, with so many publishers deciding they're going to be doing their own thing, so many first parties, Sony, EA, doing EA Play uh, at the Palladium every year, um, you know, the writing's on the wall that I think E3 is going to be changing, um, not necessarily for the, the the better or worse, but it'll be different in the in the coming years. And I think this whole situation, you know, the the pandemic that has forced us into this situation, um, is going to have an effect on that because now we've seen that it it will be possible to do it without that physical presence. So, I... yep. Um, I'm also personally rather excited to have everything spaced out a bit. Um, I think as so much we're as not, I love, we're not working 14 hour days. Yeah. I mean, we will have our long days yeah. and they will be very exciting. Um, and, and I really do like the rush of information, but at the same time, I like the idea that specifically with this year, uh, publishers and companies just have so much to announce because it is a next gen year and there's like so much to show and to really give all of that like breathing space is i think a really exciting thing for everybody because i, I don't know like especially being at home it's like i want stuff to look forward to and things to be excited about and if i have an event like every week that's just awesome and yeah. so i kind of appreciate the cadence of everything so far well, yeah. we have we have Ubisoft, we have uh, Summer of Gaming, all these other events coming. Gamescom's going all digital, and then what's going on with Tokyo Game Show? <laughs> oh, brilliant segue, Destin. Oh, God. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us, Destin? Since you're yeah, it's canceled. You're why why don't you read it? <laughs> it's now. canceled. I'm being cheek cheeky. Here's what they said: Due to the <laughs> outbreak of some strange new virus, I haven't heard of on a global scale, and the situation remains unpredictable in Japan as well, the organizer and co-organizers have reached the decision after a long consideration to place the utmost priority on the health and safety of visitors, exhibitors, and stakeholders. I probably should have not joked around there at the beginning. But anyway, Japan's uh, Computer Entertainment Suppliers Association explained in a press release, we ask for your kind understanding and cooperation. Um, yeah, so like, just you have to. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. I don't That's where so, we are. so for those of you who don't know, I pretty much run TGS for iGen every year. And it is my favorite event of the year, my favorite thing to do. Uh, and I I knew this was coming, but I was very sad about it. So <laughs> I, I love going to work with iGen Japan, and I see some other of our global companies as well. Um, and obviously I love going to Japan and working really hard, but you know, it, it just makes sense that they have to do this and I think TGS, as far as like the events go, is in a weird place because it's like, okay, we have a lot of really niche things for Japan, but then we also sometimes have really special interest things that we want to like show with everybody. But a lot of the stuff that is there is things that we've seen at Gamescom or we saw at E3 or we saw at PAX. And so I think this was the year that I was really looking forward to seeing how they show up for next gen stuff. And so it's really disappointing to see that, of course, they can't, but um, that's it's it's smart. It yeah. Makes sense. I, I actually feel the same way, Miranda, about E3 in the sense of, I mean, I totally get the situation is what it is. And you're right about like, we're at home. So having events every week to look forward to, great. But I'll tell you, I've been I've been to a whole lot of E3s now, been, been very lucky uh, over the course of my career. I still, I love going every year. Not as, I mean, yeah, the, the games are great, but actually I just, I love seeing everyone, not just like, yeah. It's all of our team together in focused on one thing, which is super cool. It's it's a great, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. But but even and seeing all the developers too, and like having interviewing them on our shows and on the, the live shows and the panels. And I'm gonna miss that sort of face to face seeing everyone aspect of it. So I I I totally hear where you're coming from on TGS. But at least you're gonna get you won't have to go to Anime Expo and lose your Fourth of July weekend this year. <laughs> <laughs> I, as much as I do love going to Anime Expo, I'm excited to have a three day weekend. <laughs> yes. Um, Instead of a set, like what? Five, six, seven, eight, like 12 day work week. I don't know. It's like just a yeah, long ass work week. It's a lot. Um, so, PAX West is, to my knowledge, the, the, next, all, yeah. the, final, the final gaming convention that's still standing in 2020. Uh, uh, that, sure. that and I. 
it's not a convention, but the Game Awards in December. Um, you know, who knows if that'll be right. a physical event? I imagine well, it I mean, won't that's be. Not even a, I yeah. guess that's not technically officially announced for this year, is it? Has Jeff? Because I, I don't know if he's actually. I don't think said. he's announced it. I think it's just one of those you you know things that you just always expect, right? Yeah. But uh, but yeah, sure. I mean, PAX West. We talked about this a few weeks ago when they had said that for now we're still mm -hmm. on. So it's TGS is after PAX West in September. So it's probably yeah. just a matter of time before PAX West has to uh, has to to fold the tents for this year as well. But no, it's hopefully we'll all be able to get back out and and get it back to all these fun conventions in 2021. Uh, all right, let's see here. We've we're running out of time, so let me go now to the loot box. And the question comes from Jordan in Alberta, Canada, and he says this, uh, Brandon. Uh, this is uh, definitely up your alley. He says, "I've become ever more excited about the possibility of State of Decay three. Sadly, mm. a cursory glance through the internet shows a lack of any new information on State of Decay three. I know Ryan's a big fan of the series, uh, and certainly Brandon is too." And would like to ask, when do you think we will see State of Decay 3? Could it be a launch title? He thinks it's unlikely. And what do you want out of what he calls our favorite zombie game with lovable jank? <laughs> Brandon Tyrone. <laughs> I really do love that phrase, lovable jank. Um, <laughs> I think it's the perfect word to describe a game that just, oh, so much potential, but so many like little, little nagging issues that don't ruin the experience. Um, I don't think we see anything from Undead Labs uh, with regard to State of Decay three for. S I'm gonna I'm gonna soft say two years. I think I think we have multiple long, years. Huh? I think we have multiple years ahead of us. I mean, look, right? You and I have been excited about the State of Decay series since the beginning. You know, since Jeff Strain made Undead Labs and they they first yeah. started talking about it. The the plan. I think this was 2012. Um, certainly before I was at IGN. I'm not even sure if you were there yet, but. <laughs> The plan yeah, was all, there. Yeah, the, the the plan was always to release game one, which was codenamed Class Three, yes. and that would be the proof of concept. the The idea was how would you survive during a zombie apocalypse, and they made that game. Class Four was supposed to be this sort of cooperative hybrid MMO yep. uh, that was going to have lots of multiplayer elements in it and a persistent world. I believe it was persistent world. I, don't quote me on that, but but basically, you'd be running into other survivors, and so you'd have an to make, MMO. You you said it. It was going to be basically an MMO. Yeah, yeah. So you'd have to make the decision of like, do we group up? Do you know adding that Walking Dead element where like right. the zombies aren't the most dangerous thing; it's the other people. Um, that didn't turn out to be the case for Save Decay Two. For for I'm, I'm sure. I mean, we have a, a million interviews and coverage on Save Decay Two. I'm sure we we glossed over that. Um, I would expect State of Decay 3, or now Class 5, I guess, if you want to call it that, I would expect it to be that full-fledged leap to that online persistent world. Um, and I say that because now they've got the engine under control because clearly it's fairly unruly. Um, they have enough content and enough know-how assets in the can. Like They have the foundation to make something, to take that next leap, where they don't have to worry about making the game. Now they they worry about expanding on it right turning it into a whole universe and creating that new that that new sort of persistent world version of the game and there's so there's so many um examples of doing mmos on consoles now with eso and um black desert and i mean there are sure. a million of them final fantasy there are a million oh, of yeah. them out there so now we know it works the netcode can support it all that it takes is is putting all that know-how together so I'd expect in a couple of years to maybe uh, hear a couple or hear some teases and some hints about what's happening. I wouldn't expect to see State of Decay 3 until mid, uh, mid cycle next gen. You think so? Because I was just checking to, to check my memory. It's, oh, don't, it's, uh, don't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> no, no, just it. So it has, it's been two years now mm -hmm. since, uh, since State of Decay 2 already. So you got to figure they are, I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong at all, but they're definitely knee deep into what is presumably State of Decay 3 and in whatever form it's going to take. But yeah, yeah, I wonder if it's going to be, but you're right though, if it's going to be the class four MMO that they had originally uh, planned to make, it probably will take longer than a two, three year dev cycle. Yeah. But remember, they just released State of Decay 2 2.0, the, the right. Juggernaut edition. So clearly lots of development time has been spent, you know, patching that game up and putting it in a state where they're proud of it and comfortable. I'm sure they're proud of it, but comfortable with it and happy where it's at. Um, and I've said before, on, 
you know, a couple months ago that I, I've been playing through it again. And it's a really great game now, now that, you know, zombies aren't getting stuck in floorboards or your character right. aren't, you know, dying for no reason. So I, I would be surprised if they're too far in development on Save Decay 3. They're, they may be in pre-production because I know there's still a lot of work being pour, uh, poured into State of Decay 2. Yeah, no, I, 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 I need to go back to it too. There's so many games I want to go really back good, to. It's really good, dude. It's yeah, really good. I, I believe it. I believe it. I mean, I just remember when we, you and I, when we went up for the IGN first, we just mm -hmm. were so excited and, and it was fun, but it was definitely in a, in a rough state early on, just like the first one was, which was an extra letdown for me personally, only because, you know, they knew it. They knew that the first game was this amazing, uh, concept and, and, uh, mostly executed amazingly, but they, the team knew it was it was janky. They switched engines for State yeah. of Decay two, and and so thought, okay, great, Cry Engine's gone. They're off of that. It'll be nice and polished this time. And and then it wasn't. So it's like, oh, I still love this game, but it's just like, oh, it's it's being yeah. held back a little. So to hear that that it's come that far with a consistent series of free updates over the last couple of years is just great to hear. And, and a fair bit of content as well, right? There's yeah. a lot of new ways. Um, so I beat it on normal, State of Decay 2. I beat the campaign on normal. I escaped. And then I was like, man, that was really good. I want to play it again, but I want to play it harder. So I bumped it up to the hardest difficulty. And I've been playing through on that. And I am so close to being done. Um, and it really does feel, it's maybe one of my my favorite gaming accomplishments that I that I will have achieved when I finish it, because it is brutal. And I think it's really like the way that game is meant to be played. All right. Uh, we've just got a few minutes left. You guys are making me insane in the Google Doc right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, quickly, next segment. let's quickly do the trivia question and get out of here. By the way, I'll just mention, send us your trivia questions. Unlocked at IGN.com. Send four multiple choice answers with your question and note the correct one. So you're, I want you all to get this. If you don't, you might get thrown off the show. Uh, Johnny <laughs> Johnny Thomas, whose gamer tag is Johnny Jet, all one word, says on the Halo Collector's Edition legendary ending, what does Sergeant Johnson say to the elite that he is fighting as the Pillar of Autumn blows up? Did he say, die, you alien scum, and go back to your raggedy-ass fleet? Did he say nothing? and just salute the autumn did he say send me out with a bang or did he say this is it baby hold me uh, i will go i i think everyone knows the answer to this but i'm gonna go miranda's way first god damn it i'm gonna tell you i don't know the answer to this i don't no! remember i don't remember i was like please don't say me first i don't oh. remember <laughs> well I think the other guys know, so I, I am forced to to stick with you first to to. Ah, <laughs> see, I was drinking my my coffee a little bit longer on purpose. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm gonna go with A. Okay, I mean that's definitely something that would come out of Sergeant Johnson's mouth. So we'll see if it's the correct answer. Yeah, I agree. Brandon, go with, go with Destin. <laughs> go with Destin. Um, okay. I mean, I, I do know. I do oh. know it for sure. I've beaten that okay. game a million times. All right. Uh, Destin, do you want this to go? This is it, baby. Hold me. God damn it. Uh, hug. Brandon? This is, this is it, baby. Hold me. Yeah. I've, like I've, so I've played the original Halo like a billion times, but I've only played it on Legendary a handful of times because usually when I replay it, I'm playing with people who haven't played Halo or yeah. don't play shooters. Mm -hmm. So I have I have not beaten on Legendary in a very long time. It, well, it is a line from the game. To I be think. fair, you, yeah. you did pick one that's, if it's not in the game, it sounds exactly like something Sergeant sure Johnson would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. It, it is. This is it, baby. Hold me. And he hugs the elite. And that's... Yeah. Uh, and they embrace it. The core explodes. That. Spoilers. <laughs> That's it. So uh, that means Brandon Tyrell in the lead now with six no. points on the year. Surely not. Miranda, Miranda won back five points. Destin getting back in the thing right. with three points. This is so. why I'm trying so hard to be on the show every week during E3 planning. Because <laughs> last year I was, I was out of it by August. Uh, all right. Well, good stuff. Again, send in your trivia questions. I could use some more good ones and your loot box questions too. Same place, unlocked at IGN.com. Uh, we'll say goodbye here. You can find me on Twitter at DMC underscore Ryan. Again, check out IGN Unfiltered with Marcus Leto. Uh, IGN First with The Ascent, which is a day one Xbox Series X exclusive. We've got it for you all month long on IGN. Destin. 
Yeah, find me on Twitter at Destin Legary. I will be tweeting about my Assassin's Creed collection for the next few weeks and then whatever other game I end up playing, probably Destiny. All right, Miranda. Hi, you can fi- follow me at Havoc Rose, and that's Havoc with a K on Twitter, Instagram, and wherever else. Um, I've started streaming because I am just home. And I'm going to start playing Bioshock because that's what won my Instagram poll. So uh, check me out on in Twitch at Havoc Rose. Fantastic. BT, take us home. Uh, hi, I'm Brandon Tyrell. You can find me on Twitter at Brandon Tyrell. Uh, I'm not doing anything I can talk about right now, but I have a lot of emails to get back to. So <laughs> thanks for tuning in. <laughs> we'll let you We'll let you do that. All right. Uh, for the crew, uh, this has been Unlocked 443, and we'll see you guys next week.